podcast time, everybody. On this very special edition of Rambling About Cars, we have special guest uh, Jonathan Benson from Tire Reviews, who's going to talk with us about tires, why they are simultaneously the most taken for granted and most important part of the car. Yes. Then we're going to talk about some memorable experiences that we've all had in cars, and I think some tires are probably going to tie into that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends around the world, torturers of tires, it's time to get this rolling. Episode 7, Bruce, what do you got for us? Well, yeah, we're talking tires today. Jonathan, again, thanks for being with us. Um, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, but yeah, uh, we get, we're get we going to start with a little thing that we've do, been doing with all of our new guests, all of our first-time guests at least. Um, a little quiz for you. Sounds sounds terrifying. It, just it, it just a nice it's it's just a nice friendly personality quiz that doesn't reveal anything about your personality. Okay, sounds so, comforting. First question: What is your favorite car from the nineteen eighties? Oh, nineteen eighties. Um, my favorite car is possibly one I've owned, which is a E twenty four six three five CSI. And oh, that's the original like that shark choice. nose uh, BMW. I did own one. It was wonderful. It was the only car that's I've had that's been universally loved by everyone, old and young. But the thing was just a pile of rust because it was the last BMW not to be galvanized. So I uh, owned it for a year, bought it on eBay drunk, um, bought it for a thousand pounds, sold it for fifteen hundred pounds like two years later. But yeah, it was a it was a non recoverable one, sadly. Oh, I, I wish I could find one of those that cheap. I yeah. love that car. This was a long time love ago. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay, what's your favorite '90s car? Oh, I, I'm going to go with the uh, the SW20 MR2 Turbo, which will come up again later. Yeah, we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Yeah. What about that car makes you like it so much? I so I'm a big fan of mid-engined. I think the engine in the right place. I think it's affordable. Um, at the time, 200. What was it? Stopped 230 or 240 brake horsepower, but the. Uh, yeah, but the engine's yeah. like fully bulletproof. You could just buy it, put an air filter on, crank up the boost, and you've got something that is essentially supercar killing uh, from a Toyota, of all things. It's gone to the glory days of the, the Toyota, sadly, it seems. Yeah. And it's Maybe so hard the to find GRS is going to bring that back. Maybe that's a sign of life, but yeah. Well, if the could hype be. trains to be believed, then yes. I haven't not driven one yet, or I don't know much about it, but um, then hopefully something will come up in testing sometime. So, what is your favorite car movie? Huh. That's a good question. Um, I would have said Mad Max, like Thunderdrome, because it's essentially an hour and a half car chase or an hour and a three quarter car chase. Uh, but I rewatched it on the flight over, and uh, I'm not so sure anymore. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to pass on that one because I can't think of any others on the spot. But. Fair. Oh, well, well, I'll give you a nod. I'm I'm a huge Mad Max guy. Yeah, so I'll oh, give, yeah. I'll give we're, you a nod. We're today. we're big Mad Max Road Warrior fans here. So I've got a, I've got a slightly different question here. Um, what is the must-have song or band when you go on a road trip? You cannot go on a road trip without either this one song or this one band. Um, I was tire testing the other day and I had some music on. And the chain by Fleetwood Mac came on, which <laughs> is the original F1 music. That's how, that's what it's known to me. So uh, I think that's got to be up there because as soon as that came on, I, I, I enjoyed the moment and then I had to skip it because I was going to end up in a snowbank. Because that's just the, the drive faster and enjoy the moment music. So that's always very funny because, you know, so BBC, that was their song to bring it in, right? Or was it Sky? That was BBC, yeah. Yeah, so, and I've heard that said before by Brits, but oh, also, okay. it's just a really good song. Yeah, it's it a really is, good yeah. driving yeah. song, so yeah. it works for me too. But yeah, um, so last two questions for you. First off, what car do you own right now, or cars? In case um, sure. I have an E92 BMW M3, oh, but uh, cool. the V8, I mean, they're a bit heavy and a bit soft. It's stock form, but I bought it as a project car, so I'm Super excited to actually start working on that. That's going to be a, a YouTube thing that hopefully should be quite fun to do, if not interesting for people to watch. Oh, yeah. And also have um, a Skoda Octavia VRS as like a, a daily run around, which I know you don't Our have. Our boss here. would love you. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're really great. It's a Golf GTI in a dress, right? But it's a lot cheaper, a lot roomier, and just more practical. So we use Golfs a lot for tire testing. The Skoda um, is a great car. Our boss there's, there's Adrian a lot of, is uh, the Skoda super fan of the world. And we have a lot of Skoda love at Motor One. Yeah, he, he would love to hear that answer. No, um, I'm glad. So last one. Last one. 
heated seats or heated steering wheel. You only get one. Seats. Okay. Well done. Yeah. I mean, it's I, interesting. I, it's been split. There have been really a lot that, of it. I, basically, I, of our guests, it's been about 50 50. I like warm hands, but I mean, the seat makes a bigger difference overall. I mean, you've got small hands versus yeah. your entire backside. backside exactly. Yeah. That, that's a no brainer. Yeah. I always yeah. question the morality of those who choose the heated steering wheel. Can you even spec a heated steering wheel without heated seats? Is it a Probably real world option? not. I don't no. know, but. No. I yeah. see it as being like a choice on, say, like a mid 2000s Infinity where one is going to work and the other won't. Yeah, that's fair. Another brand we don't have in Europe, Infinity. <laughs> yeah. So you passed the you passed the test of the Chris's. Congratulations. Thank you. Let, let, let's actually talk about what you're here for, um, Tires. We've co we've covered so many of your videos, and frankly, we've done it because they're they're amazing. The content you put out is just well done. You're doing something that I think a lot of people don't really do or, or do properly or do in depth. Uh, I mean, going at different tires, talking about not just the treads, but the compounds. I consider myself a tire nerd and just the grade of the compound. It never struck me as being as important as it is. So that's the reason we're doing so much of your stuff. That's the reason we asked you here today. Um, can you tell our listeners just a little bit how you got into the whole tire world? Um, it's a bit of a obtuse story, I guess. Um, back when I was a kid, I did a little bit of karting as everyone did. I, I thought I was okay, but as puberty hit and thing life happened, I kind of put on a bit too much weight to be competitive. Um, and then I was, I, I had track cars and did a lot of track days and I like, had a real passion for car and car and tires, oh, cars, sorry. Um, my first car was an MGZR, which is not, I don't think it's one you get here. It's a little hatchback. It was built on the Rover 25 platform, and I bought it new, and it came with Michelin Pilot Sport tires, the original Pilot Sport, so I'm probably showing my age just a long time ago. Being a, a bit of an idiot, I burnt through the set of front tires in three and a half, four thousand 4,000 miles, as, as you do with your first sort of sporty car mm -hmm. running around, um, and I went and put it, took it to the garage and said, just replace like for like, and instead of the Pilot Sport tire, they put on the Pilot Exalto, which is another Michelin tire, but it's... I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. I think it got rolled into the primacy line, but it was, it's their more comfort oriented to tire. And I got out of the garage, first corner, I was like, whoa, this is completely different. Both Michelin tires, both around the same price. Like why, why has it gone from feeling like this to feeling like this with just a tire change? It like, it blew my mind. So I went on the internet, tried to find some information about the differences between tires. And it just seemed to be a, a gulf of data. So at that time, I was in e-commerce, I was a web developer, I was running e-commerce businesses um, as, as my career, I guess, and I was missing web development. So I was like, there's this gap online for tire education. I want to be that person that educates tires because I want that information. So I built this website, Tire Reviews, um, started marketing it. And then over the years, it's just kind of layered and layered. So I started it as an on the side thing, got in with the tire manufacturers in Europe, started uh, getting invited to their launch events, started getting invited to sort of things where you deal with actual tire testers. I kind of learned the trade that way, which was like super, I'm super thankful for the tire industry in Europe for picking me up. And I think the first couple of events I went to was Goodyear. Um, but that was back in 2006. So sort of 15 years ago now. And it's just rolled on and rolled on and rolled on. And YouTube was never, YouTube was never a thing I wanted to do. It was never, oh, I really want to be on camera. I want to be a YouTuber. I want to be an influencer. No interest in that. My interest is comparing things and getting data and finding out what's best and why. But as as the internet and people's media consumption has progressed, uh, it, it became obvious probably about three years ago, four years ago, even though the website had a huge influence. If I wasn't doing YouTube, I was like missing a huge slice of the pie, as it were. So I, I started the YouTube channel. I started the YouTube channel seriously, and it, it wasn't the most comfortable thing I've ever done, but it's it's opened a lot of doors for me. Um, it's got me to places I never would have got if I just stayed online. And it somehow people are watching the videos. I don't know why people watch them. They're, they're, they're super takey, super geeky, super boring. But I'm really thankful people do. Uh, and it's given me this opportunity to, to do things like this, be on the podcast or travel to the US to do all season testing or travel to Finland to do winter testing or like it's, it's, it's been an amazing thing to do. And I'm just super thankful that 
the industry and the audience have have gone behind it. Well, I mean, like like I said, just to start with, you're taking a look at tires in a way that, frankly, people should, in my opinion. Um, I mean, when I started off the podcast here uh, just today, I wasn't kidding when I said I think tires are the most important and at the same time, the most taken for granted item, um, at least in the United States, tires are marketed um, not on actually how good they work. They're marketed on how long they last. Or on and, price. And, I was thinking that cheapest yeah, well, wins. Yeah, price and, and tread wear. How long will they last? And the actual function of the tire is to give you grip and tread just kind of the, the tread and their actual functionality, I think, just kind of goes lost on a lot of people. Even enthusiasts who kind of like uh, uh, Jonathan, what you were saying with your first car, just just, you know, give me give me the same thing that you had. Yeah. And 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 you learn right away. That, OK, that there are some major differences in tires. And I mean, it's it's uh, I, I could go on and on and on about this. Oh, please do. But that's the, the interesting thing or the interesting one for me is when you see someone who's obviously put a lot of love into a project car, so running a thousand horsepower R33 Skyline, a, a real drive, ridiculous power. They've spent $10,000 on suspension alone and they've just put so much care and attention into every little part. And then you look and it's on the cheapest Chinese cars they could possibly <laughs> sell. Like, I mean, come on guys, like at least put a little bit of thought into the what's touching the floor. I know it's a cliche, but the average tire contact patch is four playing cards. Her tires. It's not a lot of I mean, tires are actual magic when you think about what they're doing. The forces they're transmitting through to the ground with such a tiny amount of contact. I mean, I mean, do you think they're taken for granted? Um, I think uh, there's a lack of education, a lack of awareness of which I guess is taken for granted. Um, it's, it's it's certainly not exclusively in America, um, Europe. I would say, especially the UK, is even worse when it comes to uh, tire knowledge and. Uh, Price. Price is probably the fact, the only factor in 60% of tire sales in the UK. At least in the US, you seem to have a lot more emphasis on premium products with mileage guarantees and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, absolutely take it for granted. I think uh, the general life cycle of a tire, or the, the way the industry sees it, is the person will fit like for like for the first three tire changes or the first three years of their car. And then they go down to the next one or two tire changes, which is why OE tire fitments are so important for tire companies. And then they they usually drop a tier, so what we call a mid-range tire for the next couple of tire changes. And then once the car's changed hand a couple of times and is uh, in the used market, then it's just eh, whatever's cheapest. And and I should point out um, mm -hmm. for those listening, um, Jonathan's website tirereviews.com. That's T Y R E reviews.com. Um, <laughs> Oh. Hey, hey, tire, tire. We might oh. say aluminium on this program at some point here today. Um, no, tirereviews.com. There's there's so much good information there. We'll have links, obviously, in, in the YouTube description. We'll have links um, in the article at Motor One. Um, you were talking a little bit about kind of just stepping down and the price point. Um, and you were also talking about um, how automakers are involved. And I hadn't, it, it never really occurred to me I know that automakers will have various brands of tire on their vehicles, but it never occurred to me until just a few years back just how critical that is for some of these manufacturers um, it, with their performance vehicles, especially. Um, I, I mean, what have, have you seen that firsthand? Just how in depth automakers will get with tire companies to develop a, a tire like for like for to send a Porsche around the Nurburgring. Uh, Porsche is a great example. So let's let's use Porsche. So for for the average automaker, so say a Toyota Camry or something. I'm sh uh, that might be a bad example in here because I'm not sure what the OE fitment status is like. But in Europe, for like an Audi or a BMW, you've got you've got an OE tire, so a Start Mark tire, a MO Mark tire. And that's been developed in conjunction with the car. And those programs, I mean, they're not insignificant programs. They are the car, the tire companies are submitting uh, tires for submission. The automakers are coming back. So they take submissions from three or four different brands because no automaker wants uh, like one manufacturer as the OE tire on their 
their product for production because as soon as you get a production issue with that brand, then all of a sudden your your entire supply chain shuts down. So they all have three or four. In theory, all three or four brands of tires should be pretty much built to a, a similar spec. That they're, they're not identical for sure because different tire companies have different ethoses and different ways of building tires. But in theory, the manufacturer's test team's job is to get these three or four OE tires as similar as possible so as not to have big deltas in in the handling or dynamics of the vehicle. Porsche, especially GT, so you've got Porsche Road and then Porsche GT. And I know, obviously, companies like Pirelli and Michelin work very closely with Porsche, uh, Porsche GT. And we're talking years and years of development and hundreds of test cycles and hundreds of bespoke manufacturing thing and huge changes, especially for a car like a 911 where you've got quite a counterintuitive weight balance. Um, the amount of work that goes into a, like a dedicated end tire or a sport tech, a Porsche spec tire is huge. It, it's huge. I don't think a lot of people realize just how much uh, people, how much work goes into it because a lot of people think it's marketing or a way of Porsche keeping their customers in the dealers. And I know there's some controversy with the Porsche warranties because Porsche won't honor certain warranty claims, but only for their extended warranties in Europe because it's, it has to be a legal thing for their standard warranty. Uh, but there is a, a huge amount of work that goes into it, and it's, it's millions and millions of pounds for these tire companies. Tire companies pay for development for the privilege of having the best tire <laughs> on their best car. And, and you think about how quickly all that millions of dollars of development can just disappear once the owner takes the car and says, oh, you know what? I want to go with these Kumos. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's just, it kind of blows your mind. Yeah. You, you've got, is that the new GT3 RS? It is um, beautiful car. Uh, I believe it's coming on the Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s um, and yeah, work of art. But I don't think you'll find an owner of that sticking a pair of Chinese ditch finders on too quickly. At least you yeah. hope you wouldn't. The Porsche guys, <laughs> yeah. the Porsche guys know what they're doing a lot of the time. Yeah. Today, uh, as we record this, um, you know, we, we record a few days before a post, um, uh, the Porsche 911 GT3, the new one debuted today. And uh, we're, we're looking at it now. If you're not following us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com motor one is our channel. Um, Jonathan, can we talk a little bit about treads and compounds especially um because i like i said i always considered myself kind of a tire nerd um in college i worked at a used car dealer nice. that, that was really into i mean i mean they wanted to have good tires on all of their vehicles they didn't want to keep sending it down the road to have it done so they actually had they had an old school like pneumatic uh, tire demounting machine. I'm talking like from the sixties. Oh, um, hard work. And then, and then they had a tire, ba oh, it, oh, it was, it was brutal. Yeah. And then they had just an old tire balancer. It, it wasn't, you know, an electronic balancer. It was just like the little triangle box with the little bubble in the middle. Yeah. You set it on that, there yeah. and, you, and you, oh, you didn't even spin it. You, didn't, okay. you, just, you set it on there and you just put weights at different points of the tire until it kind of set it. So, I started with that and then they got some better equipment. So, I mean, I spent several years just mounting and demounting and doing this and plugs, but the, the importance of compounds never really got to me, especially when it comes to winter tires. And, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about winter tires later, mm -hmm. but compound isn't just about, um, you know, like, like soft grip for, for race cars. I mean, it, the compounds matter as far as summer and winter um, seasons, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. The, I mean, back in the day when I was young, I always thought the tread pattern was what gripped into the surface of the, the tarmac, but it's not. Um, and tires are, are well beyond. A lot of people just think of the classic friction model, like you put more pressure down, you get more grip. But tires, there's a lot of chemical interaction with the the tire compound of the surface as well. But I think the best example of that I, I've seen to date or I've experienced to date is either the Michelin Pilot Sport Cup Two to the Cup Two R because I mean, they're essentially the same tread pattern. You've got maybe a, a little less land to sea ratio on the Cup 2Rs. You've got more rubber in contact with the road. But the, the big difference between the Cup 2 and Cup 2R is the Cup 2R is essentially a straight from motorsport comp uh, compound. So the way that thing heats up and then sticks is like it, it, it bends physics almost. <laughs> um, and then I've just finished testing up in Michigan and I did a test between the internet's favorite tire, the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S and then the Michelin Pilot All-Season 4. And essentially, if you look at them, 
the tread pattern isn't vastly dissimilar. Like they're both asymmetric uh, UHP looking tires. Obviously the, the All Season 4 has a little bit more of a, uh, a little bit more cycling, a tiny bit more cycling, but it's nothing like a winter tire. And the All Season 4 with its barely different tread pattern was 70 seconds around 100 second lap quicker than the Pilot Sport 4S. Like it just com completely mind blowing at what they can do with compound now. And that, that applies to wet, dry, snow, ice. Yeah, I, I, I caught that video because you just put this video out. Um, yeah. and, and I caught it uh, earlier today. Uh, and we have it up here on our, on our YouTube stream now. Um, the, the difference in the first place with last place in, in, in that series was, was pretty shocking. Yes. I mean, these are all the all season tires as well. So separate to this video, um, I shot a secondary video, which will be out later this year with the all season four, which won this test by an impressive margin. And then the summer counterpart and a, a Michelin XI snow and the Delta between the, this is, I guess this is a spoiler for anyone who might watch the video in the future. But the delta between the three sets of tires was, um, I think it was from the XI Snow, which is a, an incredible extreme winter tire, onto the All Season 4 was 20 seconds. And then from the All Season 4 to the PS4 was another 70 seconds. <laughs> but the PS4 and the All Season 4, they, they almost look like the same tire. So that shows you like just how much a compound or the black art, whatever they want to call it, uh, actually matters. It uh, and I mean it still blows my mind um, the difference you can have with tires and yeah. and I've talked to so many people, especially when they're living in winter climates, about okay, if you're running in snow, you really need a second set of snow tires dedicated for the car. And I've I've had a lot of people just kind of say, well, I've got I've got all wheel drive. Well, okay, all wheel drive can get you going, but that's that's thirty three percent. Yeah. What about the other 66%? So, I joke with people. Okay, go go ahead, Bruce. I've been talking a lot here. That no, 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 that enters into my first question is uh, obviously a dedicated winter tire is going to be better than an all-season tire. There's no doubt about that. But is there a point in do you feel as though that there's a point where the compromise is worth it? That someone who say gets you know, a smattering of snow every year that they could get away with just having an all season versus having two sets of tires. Cause I'm just looking at it as the normal person out there, not necessarily a performance driver, someone, you know, that's driving your Camry or a cord or something like that, that doesn't, you know, see the need to buy, have two sets of tires and to carry or, or to store them for part of the year. Where do you see the point at which snow tires become necessary versus it's okay to have all seasons? Uh, so you don't need to be a performance driver to lean on ABS in your car and you don't need sure. to be a performance driver to have like a child step out of you at 40 miles an hour and you have to emergency swerve around them. So although, yes, we test the tires at extreme limits, these are limits that do get used by everyday drivers on the road um, just in rare occasions. But it's those rare occasions where you really want the grip of the tire. So I guess to answer your question, in an ideal world, in a, in a climate that requires, so in a climate that has sustained cold temperatures, if you're a performance driver, you're always going to be better off. Or if you have a performance car, you'll be better off on a summer and a winter tire. Just because by fitting that all season tire, that kind of jack of all trade that tries to do everything, you're kind of losing a bit in the dry, a bit in the wet, a bit in the snow, mm -hmm. and it's not an optimum package. But there is certainly an argument for these modern all season tires or modern UHP all season tires that we're talking about. I mean, they're pretty good in all conditions. But again, compared to like the Pilot Sport 4S, the Michelin Pilot all Se Sport all season four is. Michelin say themselves, you will be significantly better off on the Pilot Sport 4S, so the summer tire, over the all season tire in any temperature above oh, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 7 degrees centigrade. So we're not just talking about snow. Yeah, you could definitely get away with fitting an all season tire uh, year round in areas of light snow. And heck, I'm in Salt Lake City at the moment and People go up the mountains all the time. A lot of people are on all-season tires or all-train tires or mud-train tires or lots of other things that 
don't work optimally in these conditions. But if, if you want the safest and the most enjoyment, then a, a dedicated summer and winter tire is, is always best. You do have <clears throat> a third, fourth category of tire here. It gets confusing between the EU and US, but what you call all weather tires, so like the Michelin Cross Climate 2, sorry for leaning on Michelin a lot for this. No, they just no. They, they segment a lot of their brand and they're well known on the internet. So it's just an easy reference. Mm -hmm. uh, the Michelin Cross Climate 2, which you call an all weather tire, that's what we call all season in Europe. So we don't have your all season tires. Um, so th an all weather tires are also a very good option, uh, like the Cross Climate 2. Um, or the Vredstein Quattrack Pro is another quite popular one. And these have a bit more snow performance than. Um, an all season tire, but then again, in, in the summer months, you're losing out. So a tire is a compromise of things. Um, if you want it to be the most like or the safest or most proficient, you'd have a slick for the hottest days. You then swap to a summer tire, you then swap to an all season, then an all weather, then a winter tire. Uh, so it's, it's obviously not, it's not, it, it's pretty much impossible, sorry, to, to have the best tire on for all conditions. Um, but yeah, a dedicated summer and winter does bring advantages over an all season tire, especially if you enjoy driving. Well, I think there are quite a few people in the United States, at least that, um, seem to, seem to go with slicks, whether they want to or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that's another topic for sure. That's yeah. Oh, that's, that's definitely another topic. You said something that I want to, um, jump back to, um, earlier about, um, you know, a child stepping out in front of you. Um, a vehicle spinning out where you need to make that emergency decision. Um, and this has kind of been my speech to people when they, cause, cause I've talked to a lot of people, friends, coworkers, um, they, they'll come to me for some advice. Okay. Uh, should I get an all wheel drive car? Do I need this? Cause I, I travel a lot through snow. Um, and, and I tell them, I mean, it, it, it's really about the tires unless you're, unless you're going up into the mountains or the Hills where you're running through, a foot or more of unplowed roads, get a, save some money, get something with just front wheel drive, or maybe even a big boat with rear wheel drive and have your good set of winter tires. And when it comes to having the extra set of tires, winter tires, uh, summer tires, I kind of break it down like this. It's like, if you could save somebody you loved with a thousand dollars, would you do it? Hmm. And Everybody says, well, I mean, yeah, I, that that's that's a no brainer. If I could save somebody with a thousand dollars, I would do it. But then you say, well, OK, here's a thousand dollars for a new set of snow tires mounted on new wheels. I, I can't do that. Well, if one point in your life you run into a situation where you need that extra grip and as we've seen so often in in your tests, especially with some of your snow tests, your braking test that you did, what was it? I think a couple of years ago, where there's that there was like almost like a football field between the two vehicles, the stopping distance. Right there's your thousand dollars saving somebody's life, and you know, I mean, there's I get I get kind of preachy on that, but my first really? experience with snow tires opened my eyes in such a startling way. Um, and it stuck with me to the point where I've got my Mustang sitting in the garage with snow tires and I enjoy going out. I've, I've needed it the last few days because my Mazda has had some mechanical problems. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started the podcast about, uh, the guys with their big pickup trucks thinking I can go through the snow. Well, maybe if you engage four wheel drive, you can, if you have four wheel drive, but without it, I'm actually pulling away from them in my Mustang. So I'm, mm. I, I, I won't preach too much more. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I was just going to say the other thing, um, which is kind of useful, is like in Europe, there's a big push to stop calling them snow tires and starting calling them winter tires because they're not they're not just beneficial in snow. If compared to an all season or a summer tire, any time the average temperature is below about 40 Fahrenheit, 45 Fahrenheit, when you're starting to commute with a little bit of frost on the ground or you you have wet days, which obviously we see a lot in in Great Britain. Uh, that's when a, a winter tire can bring a significant advantage over a, a summer tire. So um, there is a there is a bit of a conception that well uh, we don't see that much snow, so there's absolutely no point in me having them. Yeah, the, the biggest advantage of them is in snow for sure. That's where they shine. That's what they're designed to do. But they, there's also advantages for the other four or five months during the cold the cold period. So they, they, there's there's many reasons to have it. But I I, I 
generally do fully understand that no one wants to spend an extra thousand pound but if you break it down per wear okay it's a bigger initial outlay but then you're wearing down two sets of tires so over the course of 40 50 000 miles it's the same but i guess the other argument is storage which is something that's a, a little bit harder to counter argument because some people just don't have the space to store a set of force wheels and tires yes yeah, so everybody's got a living room <laughs> everybody's got a living room yeah. you know what you can lay them down put a nice little piece of glass up there you got an instant coffee table yeah and then in the winter time you can save somebody's life possibly your own bruce i've I have, been talking a lot what the, what kind of questions do you have here so i've got speaking of winter tires snow tires i've got i got i guess kind of sort of a tire history question I, I i don't know how to put this let me just ask you so back in the day i know bridgestone blizzaks were considered the gold standard of winter snow tire that the story i always heard is that basically japan banned studded snow tires and it forced uh bridgestone to come up with something that was different and they came up with the blizzak and at least when it came out that was the best that you could do without studs is that still true today? Like, where would you rate Blizzax today versus the Michelins you were talking about, or you know, some of the uh, the Finnish brands or stuff like that? Um, firstly, I haven't heard that story about Bridgestone and the studs. It's an interesting one. I'll, I'll go and research that. It sounds sounds like it, it could be a thing. So they they do have a lot of snow in Japan, that's for sure. Um, the Blizzak, I, I think the so the Blizzak is a difficult one because we have different tire lines of Blizzax in Europe. Um, we've got the LM001, LM005, and LM005 Evo, whereas you've got the WS80, and then it's just been replaced by the WS90. And I know that's a very revered winter tire here. And from what I've seen, I've not done a, an American market winter test yet, so I'm using second-hand information, but I've, well, I've done my best researching it, and the WS80 and the replacement WS90 seem to be very, very good. Uh, winter tires so yeah I, I think they're still right up at the sharp end of of this market um the michelin excise snow and excise north four they're both studless winter tires they're both latest gen up there um you can't usually you can't argue with continental when it comes to winter tires and then you, you know a, a finnish brand nokian yeah so you've got the nokian half the polita range um which again is that they're all excellent winter tires so you've you've probably got those top four and then Goodyear in Europe I'm not so sure about Goodyear in this part of the world but uh, Goodyear in Europe also making some some fantastic products at the moment so they're the sort of what I'd say the big five in in winter at the moment as someone who grew up outside of Akron Ohio it's good to hear that Goodyear still makes a good tire I guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're Goodyear yeah they're, they're making some really interesting products both in North America and Europe at the moment so they're You've got these. You've got the big five or six premium manufacturers that that they're all trading below year on year, depending on who's got the latest technology. Gotcha. And then you've got some of the maybe the the lesser known brands like Hankook, which is very quickly becoming. I mean, I regard Hankook as a premium brand now. They have OE on Audi RS products. Mm -hmm. They have Porsche fitments. They're larger than Pirelli in terms of global tire turnover, which is bonkers. So uh, there's, a, there's a few brands, definitely. They're, they're all pushing each other on, um, for sure. So it's, it's not just Bridgestone in the segment, but it's Bridgestone are definitely a, a good product. Okay. I, can, I can personally attest to the Nokians, to the Hakas, the Haka Palitas. I had a set of those um, on a 1992 Ford Mustang. I've had a few Mustangs. <laughs> Fantastic. S several years ago, um, I bought this car. I was riding just part-time for another outlet, and I bought this car as a joke for a winter car. I said, I'm in Michigan. I need a winter car. What would be the best winter car I could get? A V8 Mustang convertible. That's awesome in the winter, right? With no weight in the back. And I tell you, with these with these Noki and Hakapolitas, and then I had um, a couple bags of cement in the trunk for a little extra weight in the back. It was it was absurd how good this car was. Um, Jonathan, one of your early videos on your channel. Is, has a race between a BMW and I, I forget, it was an SUV, I think. It's like, it's like one of the earliest videos on all seasons, and the BMW was on snow tires. And and the BMW just pulls away. I mirrored that in this Mustang racing a friend of mine. Slow speed race. I mean that's I mean that's that's the that's the difference in snow tires. There's always yeah, there's always something satisfying, especially in the UK where 
we, we have about two percent fitment of all season on winter tires so the 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 once every five years we do get snow if you're on the right tire there's something incredibly satisfying going out <laughs> driving around in your front wheel drive shopping car uh, going up the local hill and passing all these multi four thousand pound uh four by four spinning there on the spot and just getting some really confusing looks like how are you doing this and like right tires tires yeah. Tires make they're they're take it for granted. Tires make all the difference. You can have a thousand horsepower, like you said. If you have crap tires on there, the power makes no difference at all. Um, Jonathan, we're we're getting kind of low on time here. Sorry, sorry. Is, is, is there? Oh no, no. We're, I, I'm the one to apologize. I talk a lot, well, and I'm see. sure all the listeners out there are like Smith. You need to shut up, Jonathan. Let me give you an open mic here. I mean, if, if you could tell one thing to everybody about tires what would it be do your research we're not like when i started my car journey and there wasn't information sources online uh, there is now multiple points in the us consumer reports put out big tests every year tire rack are an excellent company not only for buying tires but the tests they do are incredible um, then you've got people like me um, who do some really in-depth thorough testing like uh, there's information out there to help you decide what is not only what is the best tire, but what is the best tire for your driving style? So like you say, you have a lot of people with trucks that just throw on AT tires. If they're never seeing off-road use, then you're, you're losing maybe 20% performance in the wet and dry. And that's, if that's 95% of your use, that's, that's safety critical. So really have a think about not only what tire you put on, but what type of tire best suits your hair needs. So in the US especially, there's, there's lots of variation between climates and the road surfaces and everything like that. So just, just spend some time online. I think that be your own, be your own hero, I guess, do your own research. And go to uh, tire reviews.com T Y R E R E V I E W S.com. Um, Jonathan, we've got our second segment here. We're, we're hoping that you'll stick around here with us for the second segment. I'd love to. I'll try we're, to speak we're, 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 we're going to talk about some cool stuff. Um, Bruce, we've got a little bit of an intermission here and we were talking about doing something um, new with listeners. Can we you do? Yeah. Fill us in? So we want to see your cool cars. You know, we talk, we talk to guests, we talk a lot about ourselves for whatever it is, but we want to see your stuff. So if you have a project car that you want to share with us, let us know. If you just have a daily driver that you're super proud of that you, you know, tell us about it. Tell us your story. Tell us your car story. And, you know, if it's interesting and it's really good, we'll probably share it on here and maybe even possibly you'll be a guest on the show. But, you know, we want to have more, quote unquote, just kind of car people on the show. We, you know, we want to talk to you. And so if you have something cool, that's kind of the that's the easiest entry point into kind of getting our attention. So, yeah. If you have a project car, like I said, cool daily driver, an interesting car story, let us know. You know, it, it, maybe it'll just be you sending us a picture and we'll showcase your car on the show. Or maybe, like I said, it'll be an interview. We'll just have to wait and see. But yeah, or we could possibly want to see it. We could possibly roast it if if you're into the whole roast my ride thing. We'll we'll be we'll be gentle. But the point is. I mean, if you're proud of your car, I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> cut you down for it. Like I'm, it not, might not be my thing and a lot of I things will. aren't, but I'm brutal. You know, I, I'm short and I have a Napoleon complex. Okay. Well, <laughs> you <laughs> no, can be no. bad cop and I'll be good cop. I'll, we'll I'll be bad there. cop. You'll be good cop. But we're rambling about cars and we're episode seven and we're like, you know what? We need to ramble with people. So exactly. email us your stories, your pictures, podcast or motor one.com. Heck, you can also jump into the comments on YouTube. You can jump into the comments on our article at Motor One, drop a photo, or if you just want to send it to us, email it over. We would love to feature you on the yeah. program. Yeah. And and speaking of program and features, we were talking cars. about <laughs> and, and cars. We were talking about some of our memorable experiences in cars. Um, it's sort of, at least for me, it's going to tie in a little bit with tires. Jonathan, I think is going to tie in probably with tires, uh, for you a little bit. We all have memorable experiences with cars. That's what makes us car people. That's what makes us excited about cars. We're, we have to keep PG 13. So, you know, we're, we're not going to have any of the prom stories, but, um, Jonathan, 
you're the guest. Why don't you why don't you tell us about one of your more memorable experiences you've had behind the wheel? Um, okay, sure. Um, if you want to hear from me again, because I realize I've been chatting for the majority of this. Um, I think, I mean, doing what I do, I'm super lucky, uh, especially maybe not testing because testing generally involves just a car and you're doing repetition things, but uh, tire events and some of the automotive events I've been to, like I remember going on uh, the launch of the Aston Martin Vantage, the new, the new Mercedes Vantage. And um, <laughs> at the end of the day, we, I was there with actually car throttle and uh, I was there as a driver for the photographer and we'd spent the day getting some of the shots. We got back to the hotel quite late. There was a few hours till dinner and the sun was setting in the south of Portugal. And um, we, we asked to take a second car and then we just drove them over to the coast to get a, a photo of the black and the white cars together. And that, that was a heck of an experience. But I think probably the most memorable, I'm going to try and condense this, the most memorable thing I've ever done in a car was back in the day of my SW20 MR2 Turbo. And it was, it was stripped out, had a bit more boost. So it was, uh, it was, it was quick, but not like, not brutally quick. And I'd been at Silverstone, the Silverstone National Circuit on a track day. And this car was, it was tatty. It was, I'd, I'd ripped out the interior. It, things were falling off. I'd bought the tires from eBay because this was before tire reviews. And um, I remember at lunchtime chatting to some guy who was super, super proud of his brand new GT3. I think it was a 996 GT3. It might have been an RS. But he was super, super proud of it. And he was telling me, he was a, one of these people that were very much, he, he came over to ask about my car and then spent, the entire lunch break telling me about his car and his driving experience and how much he races and everything like that and obviously i was like i'm super that's an amazing car 996 gt3 fantastic so i said to her he was like oh, that, that looks pretty quick but nothing like my gt3 i was like no yeah, fair but i'd love to follow you out of the pits at lunch after lunch and uh i'll follow you around for a few laps and just see how much quicker you are than me and he was, he was on the cups the cups i think at the time and we went out after lunch and um we proceeded to follow him around for like three or four laps sitting on his bumper and then <laughs> overtook him. And after him giving me all the spiel about how an amazing driver he was and how great his car was, I then overtook him, pulled away for a couple of laps and the session got red flagged. So this was like probably about 2.33 PM, the day's due to finish at five. And we all proceed in under red flag conditions. And the guy drives in, drives straight through his garage and just out of the pits and goes home. And I'm like, have I just made a guy go home with my thousand pound eBay Franken car? Um, so that was, a, it's always nice when you're in a, what you feel like an underdog in a car, you've spent loads of time and put loads of love in like modifying, spending a lot of time on suspension and everything like that. It's always nice to, to feel like you've, uh, you've scalped someone that's a bit full of themselves, I guess. So <laughs> that, that's one of my stories. So just to be, for anyone watching on YouTube, we actually have a picture of Jonathan in that car here. It's the black MR2 at the bottom of the screen with a Lotus 7, and I can't tell what the red car is behind it. Another MR2, actually. Oh, it's another MR2. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th th so that is the car in question. That is the GT3 beater. Franken car. I, I, I miss that car sorely. It was, a, it was a good way for me to learn driving dynamics very quickly because... By, by default, an eBay car, that kind of power and price is never going to be good dynamically. But I spent a lot of, like an awful long time uh, dialing in suspension setup and playing with different cambers. Something I really want to do a video on, actually, like really digging into how much how much improvement like just camber caster and tow can make oh, yeah. on a track day. You can change the balance of a car. So that car I was initially from factory set up for quite a lot of understeer, which a lot of manufacturers, I say quite a lot of understeer for that kind of breed of car because um, it was a Rev 3. But uh, you can quite easily dial some oversteer back in with uh, camera and tow. So it's, 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 yeah, super fun. I miss that car. I drove into a ditch at high speed, sadly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so look, that, that was the hard top, not the T-top? That was, yeah. It was yeah. the hard top for weight, for weight and strength. Um, so yeah, it was a Rev3. So uh, yeah, what a car. I had a charge cooler on. I don't know if you can see, but I took the charge cooler off uh, Celica GT4 and then piped water to the front of the car. So that radiator on the front is actually a charge cooler. So there's no rear mount intercooler because they, were, they weren't the best positioned or the best for high flow uh, and cooling. So I mounted a top mounted charge cooler and stuck a radiator at the front to pipe the water around. That's cool. And that wing, correct, that, they didn't come with that. <laughs> that was an eBay special and it did yeah. make a difference. <laughs> it's the trick with wings, which a lot of people miss, is if it sat, well, low, obviously not a spoiler, but a wing. But if it's that low and it's not in the flow of air, you're not going to get much. You're not going to get much from it, which is why that new 3RS has this uh, swan neck 
wing sat high up, whereas that thing was a roof line. So it, it, it did make a difference before and after. That's going to be, a, that needs to be another test as well. How much difference can you make to a, a silly eBay car on track with a, a big wing? So yeah. I look forward to that video. Yeah. I want to see that video. I want to see it. I've got the M3, so I, I just need to buy uh, the M3. Hopefully, we'll get uh, it's an E92 M3 I've bought for this build series, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll find a big silly wing for it that's not too expensive on eBay that I can bolt on and see how much more quickly it goes. That's that's awesome. I um, c- can I go second, Bruce? Because of course. I have I have a, I have an experience that's actually very similar to yours, Jonathan. Um, the very first time I ever went on a racetrack, it was just uh, an open track session. It was at Gingerman Raceway in South Haven, Michigan, which um, I know some of the uh, some of the Southeast Michigan car magazines would do a lot of testing over there. It's basically it's about um, what is it? It's about I think about five or ten miles in from Lake Michigan. It's literally a track in a field. I mean, you're driving through just open country, open country. You come over a hill and holy crap, there's a 1.8 mile. I, I, I think it's I think it's 2.1 or 2.2 miles. Now they extended it. But this great little track in the middle of nowhere, the the corners were all safe. There, there weren't walls up there. The only wall was along the, the main straight. So it was a very safe track to really push your car on. And I went over there. I had a... I had a uh, an 89, 1989 Ford Taurus SHO. The first year for the SHOs, I went on to have a dozen of these. Jonathan, I don't know if you're if you're familiar with them. Um, they were the Ford Taurus. Obviously, was was a b- very popular American car at that time. The show had the Yamaha V6, 220 horsepower. Fun fact, everybody: in 1989, um, the Ford Taurus show was right there with the BMW 750 has the fastest sedan in the world. Wow. They both, they, they, they both did north of 140. So, of course, it was front-wheel drive, um, and I, the, the, I I didn't buy it new. This was this was like, what, when was this? Had to have been 2000, 2001, somewhere around there. Still in college, just kind of getting my feet beneath me. I'd never driven on a track before. When you go to a track for the first time, I don't care how hardcore of a street racer you think you are. It, it's nothing. It is nothing compared to when you go to a track where you can really push yourself to the limit, especially in a comfortable place like Gingerman where there's no walls to hit. Um, the open track, it was, it was a, a, a lightly attended day. So I was able to just go out there and just push the heck out of it. Let me see if I can bring a picture up of this car um, just, to, uh, just to let everybody know what, what I was dealing with. Oh, look at that. Oh, I missed that car so much. I missed that car so much. I had the police grill up front. I had the intake painted. I had uh, I had suspension modifications. I had Eibach springs and KYB struts. Um, a few engine modifications. Nothing huge, but those cars were set up pretty good from the factory. They had really fat sway bars front and rear, and the eighty nines especially. They really liked to uh, to dip into lift throttle oversteer, and mm-hmm. and it wasn't hard to really to get it to rotate. So this is my first time ever being out on a track and I'm like, yeah, I'm awesome. So I'm out there and I'm following, uh, it was, it was a, it was a Porsche 911. I'm trying to remember what generation it was. Um, I think it was still an older air cooled 911. It wasn't a turbo, but I ended up following this guy and it, he was taking it a little easy. And then, okay, here I come in my four door Ford Taurus. And and I'm kind of getting up, not super close behind, but I can tell. Okay, he sees a Taurus in his mirror, but now he's going for it. I mean, the back end's getting loose on the corner, so I'm like, oh hell yes, it's on. So I get on it. I chased him for one lap, and I closed up from probably, I'd say I was I was a truck length back when when this all really started. And I was right on his bumper. I mean, I was ready to take him down the main straight. I reeled in that 911 in my Ford Taurus. And then I had to go into the pits because I cooked the brakes. I cooked the clutch. <laughs> it, was not, it was not designed to run many laps. But that first experience with that car being on a track, you learn so much so quickly about just how far you can push a vehicle. You then get to know what it feels like when you push it too far. It's in an environment that you can never replicate on the street. 
that uh, that was my first experience on the track. I haven't had nearly enough experiences on the track. I've I've been to track days before, but that's one that I'll never forget. And I reeled in that Porsche 911 with my Ford Taurus. Conan O'Brien would be so proud. Epic. All right, Bruce, what do you got? So I kind of couldn't select one, unlike you guys. Like I just, I thought about, I, I couldn't come up with one thing. So I came up with a few things, and a few of these are going to be, one of these is going to be an embarrassing photo of me from, I think, my sophomore year of college. So ignore the goatee. Um, <laughs> you'll see. Um, so I... I studied in Germany when I was in uh, my sophomore year. I did a study abroad in Germany. And part of that, at the end, my parents came and visited me. And we went to the Nürburgring. And so it's not necessarily me in a car as much as it is. Here, let me make sure. Yep. So that is me and my dad behind me. And if you've driven any, you know, ner- games from the Nurburgring. You probably recognize that we're going down the corner, and then uh, there'll be a left, and you'll go over the bridge. And yeah, yep, um, I know where you're at. Yep, and we actually stayed at the that little hotel place behind us is a hotel, and that's where we were staying. So, but yeah, it was just a really good memory. Um, kind of cool just to just to be there. Like, you know, we did end up taking a passenger lap with a guy who was just like, we were sitting at w- where the tourist and foreign and era area is. And he saw us sitting there and he said, you want to go for a lap? And we did. Yeah. And it was a ton Amazing. of fun. Um, nice. But yeah, so n- not so much me driving, but just a, a, a fun automotive experience. Um, Next one I wanted to bring up also has to do with my dad. So in 2018, um, we went on for the Buick Regal Torex. They uh, dropped us off at the Denver International Airport, and we were basically following the Oregon Trail. And so we ended up in Oregon City, which is basically Portland. It's the next I think it's a touch north, but it, it's it for all intents and purposes is Portland. And so here we are. I forget the name of the fort. I believe we are in Wyoming in this picture I'm showing here. And that's so that's my dad taking a picture of the one we were driving. Um, I came to find out later, actually, the fort that we are at is if you're familiar with the Donner Party, this is where things went wrong for them because they went to this fort and basically as opposed to following the trail north, they decided to follow the trail south because they got some bad information. So people about a century ago or a century and a half ago from this picture, things did not go well for them. But my dad and I had a very good experience Um, and it was just a fun drive. It's not something... It was cool just to go with him. It was just the two of us and then obviously some Buick PR folks who were kind of following along. But it was just he and I in the car. And we got to drive from Denver to Oregon. And, you know, it was just a really kind of fun, cool experience. So that's a that's a nice drive, too, from there up into the northwest. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And the and the Regal. That it's, car was surprisingly nice. So that, that's the Torex. So it's all wheel drive. Yep. It's a wagon. Clearly it's a two liter turbocharged four cylinder. Like it, it did everything well. It makes me so sad. Just his Buick was really starting to get its good mojo back with the Regal. They killed all their cars. They killed all of their cars. Uh, I, I love the Torex and I loved, I loved the Regal sport back too. Yeah. And I was I was actually very close to buying one. I could have got a smoking deal, but yeah. Last one. So my first car was an 80, what? 85 Saab 900. Um, That's a BMW. I'm getting there. I'm getting (laughs) there. Okay. My first car was an 85 Saab 900. It was an automatic and the automatic transmission died and it was cheaper to buy an E30 BMW. Um, So from my, what would it be? My junior year of high school through my sophomore year of college, this BMW was my main form of transport. And you can see the mini that replaced it in the garage there because I'm still driving that actually today. Um, But 
I just have a lot of good memories with this car. Um, the best one is my college girlfriend, who is now my wife. We went, uh, you know, it was fall in like September, October in Southern Ohio. And we went to an apple orchard and it's Southern Ohio. So it's just, it's super windy, nice roads. And this one had a, a manual uh, sunroof. So there was not electric, like you just kind of, you cranked yep. it, you know, but that with the windows down, it was just, it's still a very good memory today. So, you know. How many little memories like that do we have that just, I mean, we say little, but I mean, really they're not. I mean, I have memories like that with some of the other cars I've had. I remember um, my 03 SVT Cobra 10th anniversary Mustang that I had. That's the third one. That's, that, that's, I've only had three, I promise. Um, I remember taking my the wife. Mercury Sable? uh show swap no 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 that, that's 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 a different segment of fords okay i'm, I'm, I'm talking about the mustang so i um took my wife on our anniversary if, if you're familiar with holland michigan um they, they they do a tulip festival and it's just a beautiful place to go it was just a beautiful day we had the cobra with the roof down and you know i took a couple pictures one of the pictures, they had these huge tulip fields. There was one field um, where all the tulips were red, except one right in the middle that had bloomed yellow. Apparently, it was it was a it was a different kind. I, I I'm not a flower guy. I don't know what that means, but it was this one yellow flower just in this field of red, and that with yeah, just the roof down with the Mustang. So many neat memories like that. Jonathan, do you, do you got anything else for for experiences? Um, you've, you've done you've done so much with tire testing. I I know you were I know you put the, the that Genesis into a snowbank and you knew. <laughs> um, so in my defense, the conditions were quite bad. But any any time <laughs> any time you're spending a significant amount of time on snow at, at and past the limit, um, you do you do kind of find yourself overstepping it. And in snow to, in dry and wet testing. If you're at the right location, it's a half spin. You end up half off the track. You just drive back on. Obviously, with snow, because the, the tracks are snow lined, uh, you end up in a snowbank. So I had a couple of silly spins. I had a couple of not so silly spins. But uh, it's, it's just part and parcel of testing. But uh, I guess the kind of the experiences, the more, as part of that test, one of the, the standout moments was when I'm not complaining about my job, but testing is, for me is quite stressful because I'm so oh, sure. obsessed with getting accurate data. I'm not enjoying the driving experience. I'm not enjoying sliding the car around. I'm not enjoying the time. I mean, all I'm focusing on is doing my job, and that's getting the most precise data we can and pushing each tire exactly the same and hitting exactly the same braking points where possible. So often it's just a, a big stressful experience, and especially in this test we had, it was a four-day test plan, which should have been plenty of time. First two days were complete whiteouts. I put a picture up on Instagram, I think. You just can't see anything. You can't. You couldn't see the end of the bonnet, let alone the track markers. So it was tricky. So at the end of the at the end of the four days, I went out to, I was like, I just want to get some point of view driving for the video. So I put a GoPro in my mouth and did a couple of laps. And I was like, I, I, I'm going to go back in and that's me done. I, I don't want to push my luck. And I was like, you know what? I synced up my phone, put on one of my favorite playlists, put a nice relaxing song on, and just did a couple more laps. And it, yeah, it was in a Hyundai a Genesis G70. Nice balanced car. Anything's fun on snow if it's real wheel drive. But just that kind of like, okay, I've done my job. I've got what I needed. And now I can really enjoy the moment. And if you we were talking about driving songs earlier, if you sync up the right song with the moment, it's, yeah, it's always an incredible experience. It just it just merges together. I'll yeah. share I'll I'll share one more really quick since we're Here, wait what I I, okay. I got one other picture just because it's just a picture I like of me driving. It's not a particularly memorable drive, um, but uh, so Motor One what probably three four years ago had a jet or a um, Golf Sport back, and we had just our dog was fairly young at that point, and my wife took this picture. So it's me driving and then oh. the dog and you can see that the sunroof is open and he's just like grooving that just just grooving. Yeah, it, so. it almost looks like he's driving. Well, you can see my yeah. hands. Those are paws. Looks like it's on the you steering could, wheel. Yeah. You, you could, yeah, you can Photoshop yeah. that really easy. So, yeah. Boom, OK, boom, boom, go ahead boom, boom. and do yours. So really quick, since Jonathan was talking about snow and you're absolutely right. If if you don't if you don't have a little off every now and again, frankly, you're not 
you're not working hard enough. Um, I didn't have an off on this particular day, um, but I did have a few offs in this particular car. Um, I ended up actually writing about uh, this car for a different publication in a previous life. That's a 1994 Buick Roadmaster sedan. Very it's cool. Got, it's got the, uh, it was the first year for the LT1, the, the detuned Corvette engine in those sedans. When I bought that car, it had light truck tires on it. The, the person that I bought it from, it was in northern lower Michigan. They said that they didn't like the way the car went through the snow, so they put light truck tires on it. Okay, hey, you know what? The tires actually did pretty good. I didn't change anything around, but um, there was a particularly nasty snowstorm that came into mid-Michigan that day. And at the time, I was working as a marketing manager for a, for a company near Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and I lived about 15 miles away. And they had some pretty strict rules about, hey, you know, if you're coming into work, you need to get there on time. For, for this, it's like, okay, there's, there's a nasty storm. It's not a big deal. But I was like, hell no, I'm going to get there on time. So I set myself up to leave like an hour early to go 15 miles. I was going with a coworker. She had a, uh, she had a little Jeep and we were, we were just going tandem in there. This picture was taken at a McDonald's just outside of town where we, where we met up. The main road was actually plowed in in really good shape. We go about a mile down the main road and it's blocked because there's a truck that had spun off. So, okay, now we can't take the main road. So now we dump up, jump up to a side road. It's like, okay, the side roads are in good shape. We get up to another east west road that we're going to take. Okay, this one looks in good shape. Oh, wait, no, it's not. It's completely drifted shut. And she keeps going. And the snow is probably two feet deep on this road. There's no way to see it. And I'm like, well, hell, I guess I got to go too. So I'm following her for a little ways. And then I realized, okay, that's, that's, it's not going to happen. I managed to find a driveway where the, where the wind had blown the driveway kind of clear. It was like a little Island in this massive snow. I get onto the driveway. I call her on the phone. I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm following you through there. She's like, you want to abandon your car? I'm like, no, this, this isn't actually an apocalypse. I, I, oh. I'm sitting in the car. I can drive it. She's like, well, okay, well, I'll see you there. I'm going to keep going this way. Like, oh, okay. So I make my way back out, I get back out to the main road a few miles down to where this wreck was. Main road's clear. Cool. I got this. I get down to the final road I need to take. And it's about a two and a half mile drive from the main road down to the company I work for. This is like in complete rural mid Michigan. It's a paved road, but it's not traveled very heavily. It had not been plowed. There were, poor, there were spots on that road where there's probably two, two and a half feet of snow drifted over it with spots where the, the wind had blown the road mostly clear. There were two hills, um, a sweeping left-hander, a sweeping right-hander, and then a small hill to get me to where I worked. And I'm sitting in a parking lot. There was a little bar right there at the corner. And I'm sitting there. And it's one of those moments where it's like, do I try this? <laughs> Or, or not. Now, I've been driving this car for a couple months at this point. I was writing a series on what it was like, how it's just this beast of a car, how it seems to just want to go through anything. And it was one of those moments where it's like, you know what? I don't think it matters what I want. The freaking car wants to do this. It's like you could just, it's like you could just, you could, it's sitting there idling and you could just feel it's like, boom, 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 let's go. Boom, 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 let's go. So it's like, okay, here we go automatic transmission. I pulled it down manually into first gear, got going down the road. I had a nice long straight to build up some speed, manually shifted it up into second gear and then got it up into third. And I just, and I just kept it there the whole time. And I got up to about 60, 65 on that straight. Cause there's a pretty big hill to get up at points. I would go from just about being down to the road to hitting standing snow whirls enough to where I could feel the car lifting up in the snow. Um, but the, I got a hand into those truck tires. They were 235, 75, 15s. So it's, it's a fairly narrow tire. That's what saved me. It was a fairly narrow tire. So I wasn't doing a lot of floating and I was able to just kind of use the front wheels. as almost like rudders when it got deep. I mean, it, it sounds ridiculously scary. And, but at the time it was like, okay, we're going to do this. I got up the first hill. Cool. 
I go down the second hill. I'm, I'm hitting some, I'm hitting some dry spots. I'm able to get my speed back up. I think I crested that first hill. I was down to like 30. Go down the second hill. I get my speed back to about 60, 65. The car, once again, it kind of goes between, okay, I'm on the ground. Okay, now I'm kind of floating a little bit. Constant minor corrections on the wheel. Nothing major, but just, I mean, you had to keep your wits about you. Constant minor corrections. I clear the second hill. Okay, that's the last of the big hills. There's just the small hill, and then there's the sweeping corners up here. As long as there's no oncoming traffic, these corners should be fine. And about the time as I thought that, here comes a, a pickup truck coming the other way just as I'm coming into this corner and I have to keep my speed up, right? Because I'm still going through parts of snow that might be two feet deep. So I get into the corner and the back end starts to drift just a little bit and I'm holding it just right. I keep my speed up through the corner. I'm sort of looking at the truck sideways as we pass. I got through that last corner, crested the last hill, pulled into the parking lot. I was on time. I was five minutes early for work and it remains just one of the most harrowing, exciting, daring moments of my driving career. It's like everything that I'd done up to that point, all the messing around in parking lots, um, you know, spitting donuts, just goofing around on the, on the street, doing the stuff that I was doing at the track. It was like it all came in for that one moment. And it was glorious. And I pull it into the parking lot. I'm like, yes, I am awesome. And a coworker freaking beat me there in his two-wheel drive Ranger. I was so pissed. I don't know. I to this day, I don't know how he got there. That was a little, that was like a, just a little four-cylinder Ranger with crappy tires, no weight in the back. I think he slept there the night before. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 still one of my most just harrowing, awesome adventures. And it came in a 1994 Buick Roadmaster. So when it comes to cars and passion and enjoying driving, enjoying the ride, it, it doesn't take a supercar. It just takes the right no. moment at the right time. Yeah. Supercars are too stressful a lot of the time. They're wide, <laughs> they, they they're noisy, be. they draw attention, they're bumpy. Yeah, getting something cheap and fun and unique and just yeah, enjoy the experience. No, you, you're right. I worked at a BMW dealership for a little bit uh, during college. There were a lot of people that were afraid to drive like, like the 740s and the 750s because they were so expensive. Hmm. And, and of course I'm like, I'm like, well, like 19 at that point, I'm like, I'll drive it. It's just a car. You know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a V12. It's just a car. I can, I can handle this. Modern stuff has no character anymore. Mm -hmm. Stick with the stick with the old Mustangs. You're on the right the path there. I think. Well, as, as long as it uh, doesn't keep making any noise, it doesn't like the cold. It's making some noises now, but sure. that, that'll be a discussion for another time. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I have, thank you for joining us this week. Do you have any, you know, when we put the story up, we'll obviously be plugging your site and your videos and stuff like that, but do you have anything, any plugs you want to put out at, before we go? No, just, just, just to tell people to keep, keep tires in mind when they're, they're driving, even if they're not actively shopping, just keep in mind what's under you. If you do get caught up in one of these epic storms that are blowing through America at the moment, I know a lot of Texas has been hit really hard and it's, is coming up through like if you if you can avoid driving in the snow even if you've got four-wheel drive and winter tires like be sensible stay at home if you can and if you can't and you don't have winter tires just be super mindful about braking and turning it's uh it's 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 so critical in these conditions and just be smart and be safe yeah in my area they talk about the blizzard of 76 with 1976 that they were telling people with snowmobiles to go out and rescue people Wow. Because yeah. I remember stuff, hearing about late... that. What's yep. oh go ahead, Seth. Go ahead. I oh, sorry. I remember hearing about that with my uh, with my folks. Yeah. My dad my you know, he was an avid snowmobiler and stuff. So he but yeah, that it if you can stay home, stay home. If you can't, just take it. Yeah. Uh we were talking about driving in the winter in our chat earlier today, and the keyword is gentle. Just mm -hmm. no sudden movements, just you know, keep things easy. But yeah. Well, well, Jonathan, thank you again. Um, TireReviews.com, T-Y-R-E, TireReviews.com. You also have your, your YouTube channel, Tire Reviews. Thank you so much for being with us, for, uh, for sharing your information on tires. Um, Bruce, why don't you take us out here? Absolutely. So 
good evening, good afternoon, good night. Whenever you happen to be listening to this, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks. Leave a comment. If you're listening on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts, again, thanks. Um, and send us your car. Send us your the car that you're proud of. You know, it doesn't have to be a supercar. It could be. A 94 Buick Roadmaster. It could be a a 94 Buick Roadmaster. It can be just about anything. But if you're proud of it and you want to share it with us, send it over. Um, Podcast at MotorOne.com is the email address. And then MotorOne.com is the website. And then it's just MotorOne.com, right? No dot for the YouTube. Right. Right. Yeah. And then MotorOne.com is the YouTube. So you can find us. So let us know. But thank you very much. And Jonathan, once again, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate the invite. Good to chat. All right. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.